how do we improve our program? What do we need to provide more training on? And there's a lot of stuff like that. That we're, we're, we're ramping up this year. We're going to be adding more stuff, more training to help educate people more and more. At the beginning, it was not a big concern on our training. So we just basically were like, don't even worry about that. Figure out your own service bureau cell. But now that we've been around that, we've had members that have been in since the beginning. They've got some of the fundamentals down, and now they're moving to the next steps. So like, all right, now I've got people who are asking about service bureaus. I want to be able to offer that and support them. So now we need to bring that back internally and create more support and training to help those people get that stuff set up and structured. Welcome to the Service Bureau Accelerator Podcast, where we help tax professionals start and scale a successful service bureau. Welcome to another episode of the Service Bureau Accelerator Podcast. I'm here with Uncle Daddy Ross, Pleasure. Tia, the tax goddess. And today we're going to talk about some things not to do as a service bureau. thought it would be a bit fun to just highlight a couple of things that we see happen that we're like, hey, maybe that's not the best idea for your business. <laughs> so before we dive in, again, if you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. If you're listening somewhere else, do whatever the equivalent of that is on that other platform. And if at any point you're like, hey, I want to check out more about Service Bureau Accelerator, there's links somewhere around this video or wherever you were listening. Go to the website, register for a webinar, and learn more about it. But let's just dive in. Tia, why don't you kick it off today? Yes. The title of the show is actually called How to Lose a Client Fast. <laughs> 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 the Service Bureau. Well said. Yes. If you're looking to lose a client really fast, the first thing you should do is actually max out all your fees. <laughs> and if you're a service bureau, you know what we're talking about. Your backend fees, your additional tech and trans fees, your service bureau fees, your doc prep fees. Just make it sky high to the sky. Don't give them any kickbacks. Am I missing something? When No, that's, yeah, yeah. don't max out fees. Yeah, don't max out fees. <laughs> Or if you want to lose them, max what? out the fees. <laughs> now, when is it appropriate to max out fees to you? When it's someone that's brand new and they don't have any value or history, and you're going to yeah. put a little bit more time into teaching them if that's under the umbrella of your service bureau. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. People knew it's like, or if they were prepare, right. That they're an independent that you got set up and they're filing under you. It's like, yeah, max that shit out. Max that office out because it's going to take a lot of your time, a lot of headaches and everything. And but you only live once. Do not, yeah, but do not keep them there, right? Do not try to keep people in their current position if they verbally say that they want to improve, right? Like if someone's a prepare under you and they say, oh, I want to get my own office. I want to become an ERO. And you try to keep them there. Then it's like, well. They're going to leave you I mean, quick. They're going, to, they're going to leave you. They're going to go find someone who's going to help. Over the grow. years, like we've got prior to the service group accelerator, just when, you know, I was selling software just individual, I'd speak to a shit ton of people who, wherever they came from, they didn't show them how to get an EFIN, so they figured it out themselves, and now they're just looking for software. And that's yeah. all they wanted. And I think yeah. a lot of service bureaus do themselves a disservice by not showing them how to progress in the industry. You're going to lose the client pretty yeah. fast. A lot of times, like some of the hesitancy I see, and just like this year, I can think of a couple of people that are like, yeah, I don't really want to do these preparer splits anymore. It just kind of, you know, it's a liability thing, right? And I'm like, yeah, well, we tell you to, like, we don't recommend you do it forever. If you're like, we don't recommend you do it at all, typically, right? But if you're going to, then it's up to you. You don't want that liability. But then the comment that comes back is, oh, but, you know, I'm not going to make as much. I just think that's the wrong thinking, right? That's you're not going to make anything yeah. if they leave. But if you don't, show them how to evolve they are going to leave and you're not going to make any of that money but yeah it's just uh would you rather continue to make revenue off their volume but maybe a little bit less or not right. at all and i think that's where a lot of people just struggle because they're like oh you know i usually make 150 dollars off each of their returns or whatever now it's only going to be 40 <laughs> right so what as the saying goes greedy pigs get slaughtered right. yeah and don't just say it okay hey we'll help you progress actually write it down. So first year, second year, third year, you know, in some type of tier, maybe it's 60, 40, or maybe the fee gets reduced over an incremental period of time with that agreement, yeah. because they feel like it's something that's really oh. locked in. And yeah. I remember when I, oh my, definitely don't want to do that prepared development again. But when I did do it, one of the things that I explained was 
Where's the money going that you're paying for these high fees? It's going for training, staffing, payroll costs, like, you know, the back end work. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, I didn't know that's what you use the money for. Yeah. <laughs> and then as you progress, you need this less, which means we, we take less. So you don't have to go, you know, OCD, but definitely have it written down and not just like a blanket promise. I thought you used that money yeah. for vacations, Tia. Luckily, none of my maybe, follow this a, li- a little off the top. That's just a little off the top. That's a, a fraction of the That's action. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. What else we got? What's another? The max out fees, I think, is definitely like the way we get a lot yeah. of business. Yeah. We got so much yeah. business uh, from people just coming over, getting ripped off. Can't even max yeah, out even and no transparency. Yeah, yeah. Like we've had a yeah. lot of conversations yeah, with people again. that don't even know what the fees mean. We'll end up doing a whole other podcast topic on just how to read fees. But yeah, that's, uh, there's a lot of service bureaus that don't even know how their fees are, or what they should be, or it's pretty interesting. But anyway, we can stick to talking forever about fees. Let's move on to another topic. Okay. Yeah. Getting caught up in your tax academy program. Quickest way to lose a client. Yes or no? Well, <sighs> what do you mean by getting caught up? What is that? Getting caught up in academy programs as far as like just only focusing on that. They have their use case. But again, like we talked about in many episodes, right? Your objective as a service bureau is to grow by increasing bank product volume. Someone who's never done a tax return in their life and doesn't have any volume, that's technically like that's not even really your customer, right? Just because they want to get into the industry doesn't mean that they have volume and that they do bank products, right? So it's a thing that a lot of people are attracted to because they want to be that mentorship. And I get it, right? It's coming from a place of, oh, I want to help people and show them how they can start their own tax business because I've seen success in the industry. And it's a lot of work to hopefully drag someone across the finish line and hope they actually produce volume where I think it's a lot easier if you just go direct to EROs who are already have software. They already know how to do taxes. They already do bank products and just figure out how you can get them using your software instead of what they're currently using. I think that's something that like, I'm not necessarily going to say like steadfast, don't do an academy, but I think there's other models of the service bureau that are going to help you grow and scale a lot faster. And this is not just theoretical. This is now that we've been in our, you know, with our program, we've had people in the service bureau accelerator for over three years now, and we've seen the numbers of people who have just gone after academy specifically, and they don't match up to the people who just are selling software and just focusing on that. So it's something that you want to probably get away from sooner than later. This is what I tell a lot of people on the calls. I'm like, let the big franchises, let them train up the next generation of tax preparers. And when those preparers don't want to be hourly anymore and they want to start their own business, then bring them in and get them set up on your software and show them how to, you know, get them to bring all their customers over to you as well at the same time. I mean, if you do, if you're just like so sold on the tax academy, I think the middle point is to vet who you're marketing it to. So maybe like tax adjacent. So like cr- people who are in credit repair, you know, maybe bookkeepers who are looking to who already have a business, who have, who a have business, customers, you know, sure, re- realtors yeah. who work as seasonal, but they're all really good at sales and they have a pipeline of clients. Like it, they don't know about it, but they know certain fundamentals that will make your job e- easier. Yeah. It's hard to yeah. take somebody that's got no business experience at all and you're yeah. now trying to do two things, trying to show them how to start a business and also do something that's probably one of the most intimidating things they'd want to do is do someone else's taxes because they're scared. Yeah. Start a business and acquire customers and do the <laughs> and do, this all at once. <laughs> and I'll do it all in six yeah. weeks. <laughs> yeah. And go. <laughs> oh, a lot of people seem to struggle. Yeah. <laughs> Not, yeah. Not surprised. Yeah. The other thing too is like doing too many things at once and we get it like... This is what we had our event. Our first event was last year, actually, in June 23. It was awesome. We've talked about this a lot of people being spread too thin and doing too many different things, right? Everyone loves to say, oh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. It's like, okay, great. How many businesses have you actually scaled beyond seven figures and exited? None. Okay. So what are you a serial entrepreneur of? Businesses that don't make money? Why are you doing that when you should just focus on one thing and scale the business? It's actually shame grown for me. a large... <laughs> <laughs> no, anyone who's actually like grown and scaled a successful business and an exited, or maybe they still have it, whatever. Anyone who's actually grown and scaled a large successful business, that has been their only focus. There's a misnomer about like multiple streams of income, all the millionaires. No, they built their wealth initially from one business 
And that allowed them to generate multiple streams of income. They didn't become millionaire from multiple streams of income. That's the biggest misnomer. And so it is inherent with our tax industry that, you know, tax is seasonal. And so you got to be doing something else in the off season, right? You're doing accounting, you're doing bookkeeping, you're doing insurance, you're doing real estate, whatever it is. But what we find a lot of people struggle to grow a service bureau is because they're still doing all that other bullshit. And it's like, well, just do one or the other. And I shouldn't say bullshit because it's like, look, if you prefer real estate, just do real estate. Don't be a service bureau. Don't have your tax business. Just focus on real estate. Put 100% of your effort into that. But if you want to be a service bureau, then put 100% of your effort into that. Now, I understand a lot of people, their tax business is still their bread and butter. I get it, right? You kind of want to keep it around. But the sooner you can exit that, you exit your office, the sooner you're going to be able to really focus and completely double down on your service bureau and scale it to much higher levels. So I think it's another thing that people are doing too many things at once. They got their, you know, t-shirt company, they've got their insurance, they got their trucking company, they got their tax business, and now they got their service bureau as well. And it's like, okay, well, guess what? You versus someone who is only focused on the service bureau, who's going to win, right? They're focusing 100% of their energy in their service bureau business, and you're focusing 10. They're literally 10xing you every single day, right? Oh, I can't get any customers. Well, yeah, because you only have one sales conversation a week where this person's talking to two people every day. Right. So that's some other really important things that I think that you should not do as a service bureau was try to keep doing a hundred different jack businesses. of all trades, Focus master on the one of thing. none. Exactly. Amen. Now, next one, Baldy, this one's I'm teeing this up for oh. you is things that you should not do as a service bureau. Let's talk about selling every single kind of software. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably the biggest mistake people make because they think that and we spoke about it in other episodes. It's they're trying to sell the client what they say they want, or they're trying to adjust their, oh, this person wants Drake. Oh, this person wants tax wise. Oh, this person wants this, or this person wants this. Who the fuck cares? All right. Like the whole objective, if you have all those, you're not going to make money. And there's a couple of reasons why, because you're not going to grow to a volume with one particular software to get any type of incentive that benefits you. Right. Can you break that down a little bit? Cause I like, I'm very familiar with this, but I think maybe for the audience, like, what do you mean by that? Like maybe give them a little bit behind the scenes on what happens when you actually grow a fucking service bureau and you actually grow your volume right. with a specific so software. So typically how it works is say you have one software as you grow volume, you will try and negotiate incentives on your bank product volume. And that'll go with like, when people are with us, we give them the incentive already. Like here's your benchmarks because we have the two that we primarily push, you can blend it together. That's not really how it works because in the standard sense of things, but so say, and this is what happened to me, right? So years ago when I had only Crosslink, I negotiated an incentive and then I also negotiated an incentive with the bank and it was two separate conversations, but then the problems happened when somebody wants to use a different bank. And now all of a sudden I had not, I didn't have enough volume with that bank to make any money there. So it was kind of losing money in a sense, right? Like I wasn't making as much as I would if they use this. This is what happens when people go to all these different software is Crosslink doesn't care how much products you did on tax wise. If you do 200 products there and 200, first we're probably not getting much at 200 products anyway, but if you do 200 products in one and 200 products in another, they don't care about what the other software volume is. Yeah, you're not getting yeah. any extra money. On you're not getting there. anything extra, right? So it's counterproductive. I think the biggest thing also that I see people, the mistake when they do this, and this is a reason why we don't add it. Like we get offers from every software. Hey, why don't you sell ours? Why don't you sell? No, it's not that we can't. It's that the amount of extra support that is required, especially if you're serious about the business is insane. Like we're just figuring out how to properly support OLT, which we added last year. And we're still creating new docs and training people and all this stuff on it. Like we are a hundred percent better than last year on supporting it. Yeah. But we're even still retraining like our tax layer yeah. stuff. Cause it's like, we see more how our people go through and see more training that's required to help better support. Yeah. Them. So now like we see the questions that come in when something's new. So now you go add another software and you're like, now you're trying to struggle to set somebody up or everyone's set up differently in every software. It's just a nightmare and you can't scale a support team with all these different products, it is very difficult. So the challenge you're going to face is, yeah, you may have, you know, two people on this software, three people in this software, five people on this other one, six people on another one, 
but there's no way you can train one person to learn all these things and be efficient or proficient at supporting your eros and you're just going to end up losing them anyway right get really good at yeah. one at the most two then that's all you need yeah put everyone on your main one and then if there's any for whatever reason that they can't use it or whatever then you have a backup one you have another one that you could put in yeah the one, right or a slightly different use case right like that's a nice combination that we have where we've got a nice use case where if someone tells us certain things on the sales call, like, okay, cool. We're going to put you on this other one. Cause it's probably going to be more in line with how you typically use the software to get. So it's yeah. more natural, more comfortable for you, which allows you to be able to go out and sell it with more confidence and, and sell it better as well. Yeah. So. I, I just think it's, you see all the people posting about every single option. Those are the ones to run away from. Cause there's no way they can support you. Yeah. And people ask us that, about that too, in our program too. They're like, Oh, well, what about this? We're like, oh. No, with our program, you get this. If you want other things, this program's not for you. Yeah, you don't have to sell everybody. The objection isn't like, and the biggest thing people think, oh yeah, I'll just go get that one. A lot of the times you won't even be able to move the EFIN or that customer is going to be so many other problems because you're not understanding the nuance yep. of, well, Drake's not going to give up their direct customer to move them over to your service bureau. Like they're not going to do that. Yeah. So what are you going to end up doing? You can't even sell them that software anyway. Like people just don't think farther ahead at the other nuanced steps involved in that process. Yeah, I think that's a good, any questions or anything to add on to that one on a multiple softwares? No, I'm good. Yeah. So actually, let me ask you, cause you have, <laughs> do you have all three now? <laughs> but I mean, one you phased out, it, it but your, how about your, yes, technicalities, but your experience having multiple softwares that you've had to like learn and transition, how much did that kind of, do you feel like that maybe kind of slowed you down a little bit and how much faster do you feel like you're moving now just kind of focusing on like the main one or two? I would say if you're going to have multiple softwares, it has to really be to a vantage point. Like you have to always be gaining something and it can't be that one client. Hence why I right, yeah. had trialed three softwares and now <laughs> I'm only... We'll say trialed, yes. Yeah, <laughs> And now I'm only using one. It's even down to your point, Bill, the banks, it's only one bank. Yeah. It's only one software and it's only one bank. It's too much to try and figure out and manage the support numbers are different. It's a lot. And right yeah. now I'm still one person. Yeah. So I can definitely attest to that. Well, even to add to that, because my focus on the bank was more on the incentive side, but yeah, there's different requirements for different banks that People are going to ask you a question. If you don't know how one bank handles a certain scenario, you're just going to be stuck with no answers, right? And asking for help on everything. I don't even bring that up. But you did say something that I think is a reason why a lot of people do it is they get it for one client. We had somebody add a yeah. software for one client. I'm like, you shouldn't do this. Like, sure, you want to buy it from us. I get it. I don't mind taking your money, but I'm telling you, like, you shouldn't actually do it. Like, I'd rather not take your money for this one client because you're going to regret it. And later on, they're like, you were right. I shouldn't have wasted my time with that one client for that. <laughs> There's an amount of time spent in learning and setting that person up. And then at the end of the day, it wasn't even worth it. Yeah, yeah. it's very tempting, again, having that offer. But that kind of goes back to our previous podcast, which is like the one offer situation. Mm -hmm. Also for me now as a service bureau, it's just all about the money. So I'm going to sell whatever software has the highest incentives. I get the most benefit, has the cheapest transaction fees. I don't care about the interface. I don't care <laughs> if it has eSign. I'll be taught. Everyone yeah. can learn it. I That's just think what it, my job form is for. <laughs> yeah. When we started this, we basically pushed one software. And coming from the other software, I'm not going to mention names because I hear sometimes these people watch our podcast and get mad that we <laughs> talk shit about them. Love you all. <laughs> but anyway, so they may see this one. The one that we primarily sell and we have the most people on, we actually make less money than another one. And like, it's, it doesn't affect you guys. It's just like at the volume and all the stuff that we do, it's like we actually make ones more expensive on the transmitter fees. So there's more money there, right? It's simple math. But we still sell way more of this one because it's just easier for us to set up and it's easier for us to do a lot of stuff. It's less support work to set this one up faster. So it's not for us, it's not about the money when it comes to I get for you, Tia, but I think a lot of people need to also consider the complication of the setup and learning that and supporting that. Yeah. I mean, if you're selling sub-service bureaus too, I think that your part kind of comes into play, makes sense. 
but like just being a service for, I want the most money and the cheapest amount of work. I mean, not the cheapest, but the least the, amount the of work. Easy, easy, yeah. 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 Yeah, sure. so that would be a combination. Yeah, that, that would be a combination of yeah. those things, right? Like, would you trade and that's what two dollars a to. product for a much smoother setup process that you can outsource quicker, <laughs> right? Like, possibly, yeah. right? I think that's like a no-brainer. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, that- I was so sold on the other software I was trialing, and I would not let it go. But once I actually broke down all the fees, I'm like, oh, hell no. Yeah. That $13 could be my $13. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it was 13. That's your vacation <laughs> tax. Exactly. Yeah. But that's the thing though, right? With like, and that's coming back to like, do not, what you should not do as a service bureau is trying to sell all the softwares because like, again, the volume incentives, right? Being able to grow and get and negotiate better deals, but also the fulfillment and support, right? Like that is just a massive thing that people really don't understand. And it's typically because they really don't understand what it means and what your roles are when you are a service bureau, when you're responsible for ish, like setting up the EROs, issuing the license, managing, like adding prepares and rolling them in the banks. You have to learn that five different ways for the five different softwares. And then you're the one stuck doing that because you can't train someone to learn all that because it's way too complicated. It just does not work at scale. Whereas like in a perfect world, if we could just sell one, we probably would just sell one. And it's like, no, this is the software. This is it because it just allows it to be Every single process is laid out, mapped out. It's quick, it's efficient, it's easy, and we can scale the hell yeah. out of that. Question so, comes into, two is, oh, cool. Everyone knows the answer. How does it work with this software and this thing and this, like, it's just, it's too much. Yeah. But you, Tia, you'd mentioned something about subservice bureaus. And that's actually our <laughs> next point that we wanted to get, talk about today was things you should not do as a service bureau, selling service bureaus without really knowing what you're doing as a service bureau to begin with. <laughs> Like, I think a lot of people, I'm kind of curious because this just may be isolated in our group because our group is all about service bureaus and there's a bit of an echo chamber where we assume that everyone wants to be a service bureau and everyone wants a service bureau. And so people are trying to sell service bureaus, but we see all way too often people who are in their very first year who've never even enrolled someone in the office. Like, oh, I want to offer them a service bureau. It's like, do you have any idea what that entails? Do you have any idea what that means? Because as a service bureau, you have to support all of your customers, which means if you sell someone a service bureau, you also have to support that service bureau. You have to teach them how to set up an office. You have to teach them how to enroll someone with the banks. You have to teach them how to troubleshoot stuff. You have to teach them how to support your software customers. Now there's so much more that's stacked on as your responsibilities. And when you don't even know how to be a service bureau in the first place, now they come to you with questions that they assume, you know, and you don't guess what? They're probably not going to have the greatest experience. And guess what's going to happen? They're going to leave. They might start looking elsewhere. They're going to leave. No, they are. Like, it's unfortunate. I think people jump into that a bit prematurely. We tell them, like, we, yeah. we try and talk people out of it. At the end of the day, look, it's your yeah. business. You want to do it. It's just, the reason we try and talk people out of it is because we know we're going to end up being responsible for supporting them, helping them support their people. <laughs> right? yeah. They're trying to figure but out how to support ultim- their customers. They have to come us to get those. Yeah. Answers. Ultimately, yeah. like I think, and just what we've seen in like the questions, look, we're all four people doing it. Like we're actually doing a lot more internally this year to help support you guys supporting that scenario. But I think before people dive down that they should fundamentally know the ins and outs of all the setup and the nuance of their software before they go yeah. that route. Cause you know, we get tickets in and just think about it from your client's perspective, right? Say Tia, you go and sell a subservice bureau and you're not too familiar with a lot of the back end stuff or you're, you don't really, maybe you've only set up one client before and you've did one season, right? Let's just use that example. Now this person comes to you and it's like, Hey Tia, I just got this reject for this bank app or, Hey, what is this other thing? Why can't I start a return? What's happening here? And instead of you being able to quickly diagnose and give them the answer, you have to say, okay, let me find out for you. And now they're waiting for you to figure out how to properly pose the question. And then for us to try and understand what you're saying, because you didn't get the information properly or didn't get us anything to look at or whatever. I think the most common one we see is like, Hey, there's such scenario. And it's like, right. Well, what's the Ethan? What's the locate? Like, you got to give us something to look at. Like, we don't know that experience for your customer ends up being, well, every time I ask Tia a question, she doesn't know the answer. She's always asking someone else. So why don't I just find the person that they're asking? Right. And we don't want that. Yeah. Right. Like that's not what we wouldn't want people find digging us up for that scenario. 
But I think they'll either find us or find someone else that just knows more. Right. And Baldi, what I also hear people are, you know, members talk about, and I think there's a big confusion here is they say that they want to sell a subservice bureau, but then they also talk about branding. And I think it's like, those are co-branding and a subservice bureau, two different things. Right. Like mm-hmm. the person wanted to have their logo on the software versus the person wanting to set up with the capabilities. Yeah. To yeah. sell software. When I hear that question, that's the number one indicator that you should not be selling this yeah. because you don't know what the differences are. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of that. And that's, again, like, this is something that we always look at, right? It's like, how do we improve our program? What do we need to provide more training on? And there's a lot of stuff like that. Baldy Purdy alluded to that. We're ramping up this year, going to be adding more stuff and more training just to help educate people more and more. At the beginning, it was not a big concern on our training. because we just basically told everyone, like, don't even worry about that. Figure out your own service bureau cell. But now that we've been around, that we've had members that have been in since the beginning, They've got some of the fundamentals down and then now they're moving into the next steps. We're like, all right, now I've got people who are asking about service bureaus. I want to be able to offer that and support them. So now we need to bring that back internally and create more support and training to help those people get that stuff set up and structured well. So a couple of things, since we are talking about support, right? It's like you are, you know, even as a service bureau, now it doesn't matter if you're selling subservice bureaus, but just as a service bureau, the first word is service, right? And if people have problems, right? If people are getting a weird error in the software or they're trying to set someone up, but they can't set up their prepare because the email is already in the system, whatever it may be, they need to go to you for support, right? You are their service bureau. That is a part of your roles and responsibilities. One thing you should not do as a service bureau is not have a way for people to reach out to you and communicate to you, whether it's email inbox, whether it's a phone system, whatever it is, you need to have something in place. This is another horror story that we've seen. We've heard from so many people coming from other service bureaus where they're like, every time I I need help, I have to send them an email and it takes them a week for them to respond. Or, you know, I go into some like discord channel and I have to sit there and wait for someone to show up, (laughs) right? Just completely unreliable methods of communications to be able to support customers. So if you are a service bureau, do not skimp out on support right? Make sure that there's a way. And it doesn't mean that they can light your phone up anytime they have a question. I'm not saying that. Make sure you've got some sort of system in place where there's just an inbox that they can always reach out to because then you can start having a VA kind of start responding to some of those questions, start getting them trained up so they can help you on support. Whatever it is, just make sure that there's a way for clients to communicate with you. That's probably one of the biggest, probably the most common things that we've seen for people leaving their service bureaus and starting their own with us is because they're like, oh, I can just never get a hold of my person. Or even we've seen a lot of people move around service bureaus this year, like insane amounts, yep. like within yep. our group and yep. externally, like yep. we'll find, oh, this Ethan is missing. Oh, they went to another service bureau, yep. right? So we see that a lot. Remember that email we had the other day? So we have a customer. So a member of our program who has a service bureau set someone up under her who has their own service bureau. And that person's customer has been trying to talk to that service bureau. So we're like three layers deep. Mm. Can't get a hold of them somehow found our information and (laughs) emailed us saying, Hey, I'm under so-and-so I need help. I need to get like my software, like my office set up. The person hasn't responded. And so it's like, what do we like? The problem where that happens is they've tried so many times they end up calling tech support 50 times and they just finally say, all right, well, the only solution we have is to get you in touch with these people. Right. Cause obviously there's no response on the appropriate channels. Yeah. So we get some of those escalations and, and we're not necessarily here to support them, but I mean, what we did is we just went back to our direct customer. Cause that's really who we support, not their customers. And we said, Hey, your customer's customer is having an issue. You should reach out to them to help them out. And she did. And guess what? She's going to pull that person over next year because that other service bureau is just not offering the support, right? Not helping the person you're going to lose business. So always make sure you can have open communications. It doesn't have to be within an hour. Right. But if they shoot you an email at 10 in the morning, you should be able to respond by two. Like, you know, there's no reason why you can't respond to them at a reasonable time during the day, especially during the tax season, which leads to wait, is that? Huh? Yes. Which leads to another topic oh. of, well, I guess that's subservice service Maybe we'll leave that for now. But yeah, I mean, it's going to lead to not being able to retain clients, right? They want to have communications with you. Again, it doesn't have to be over the top. They don't have to have your cell phone number. They shouldn't be able to let you up on text message all the time. 
But if they've got a support inbox or a ticket system, whatever, there's a lot of tools you can set up to really have some streamlined support to make sure that your customers always have an area to go out and reach out to you and get the help when they need it. So make sure you got something like that in place. Yeah, especially for service bureaus that are EROs also, that becomes more important because I think one of the, the causes to the lack of support is if you're a service bureau and also an ERO, if you don't have a system or a process in place to support your EROs during the season, because you're too busy, they're probably not going to stay, right? You're going to struggle there. So obviously, you know, we tell everybody, if your goal is to leave your tax office and do the service, let's work towards getting you to that goal. I think a lot of people end up wanting to become service bureaus to eventually stop doing taxes, but you need to think you're not going to be able to retain customers if you're not supporting them during the season when they have a question for you, right? Yeah, you could send them to software tech support. Software tech support is not going to help them with certain things, right? Their t software tech support, they're not going to answer questions about the bank apps or this or that you have to actually initiate or solve for them. So I think that ends up becoming evident when stuff gets escalated over to us. So this person doesn't answer during season because they're too busy with their own tax office, right? And that's not the experience you want your customer to have. Yeah, for Absolutely. sure. Oh, another thing that service bureaus should not do is you should not wait until December 25th or this January. Start setting up offices. January, <laughs> no, not even that. To enroll your service bureau with the banks. Because if you can't enroll your EROs, in October, when they want to go get their loans from the bank, they're going to go find somewhere else to enroll and you're going to lose them there. Like we saw some people like, oh, I lost this because, well, you didn't do your service bureau enrollment. You didn't show up until a week before tax season. You think all your other customers are going to wait for you to? Like that, I think that's a common thing because the service bureau isn't a tax office. People are used to that. Oh, I'll wait till the week before. Let me procrastinate until the season to get ready. But now you have other customers. You can't wait till you are ready. You know, they're going to move at their own pace. Yeah. So if you're not ready, they're going to find somewhere else. Yeah. The yeah. service bureau is pretty it's, much it's, a year around. around. It's year around. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking the same thing. Yeah. And it's different things. I mean, maybe we can talk about another episode, like during each phase, like what you should be doing. Service bureau seasons. Yeah. Service bureau season. Absolutely. There you go. I'm going to make a note on that. <laughs> service bureau seasons. Awesome. Well, I think that was a good little conversation there, but a lot of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of things we see. I think that those are probably some of the most common things, right? Um, maxing out fees. Because again, people are going to, well, especially once they start getting savvy to it and start realizing like where all this money is going, they're going to go elsewhere. Keeping people in there, in the, trying to keep people in the same place, right? Being greedy where it's like, oh, well, I'm going to lose money. I'm not going to make as much if they do X, Y, and Z. It's like, you're also just going to lose them as a customer. So help people grow. Yeah, you're going to make less money off them per product. But at the end of the day, again, this business model is about product volume, not dollars per product, right? That's how you're going to lose people by trying to maximize your dollars per product. It's about getting as many products as possible and the dollars will sort themselves out. Spending too much time getting caught up in like an academy or going after the wrong type of customers who aren't really ideal clients for your service bureau to grow your product, trying to sell all these kinds of different softwares, trying to do multiple different business models at the same time. Focus on one thing, right? Focus on one, maybe two softwares. Just focus on your service bureau. Give people good deals. Get them set up so you don't have retention issues where people stay with you because they've got a great deal. And uh, provide support, right? Just be available for support. If you can check all those boxes in your service bureau business, then you shouldn't have any problems scaling and really growing. All right. Is that it? I think that cool. covers I think that lot. wraps it yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. All right. Wrap it up. So again, if you guys enjoyed the podcast, enjoy the episode. Again, comment. Like I haven't gone into our YouTube too much, but uh, we would, would definitely love to see some more comments. If you guys have any thoughts or feedbacks or even questions for us, you know, like, comment, subscribe to the channel, Spotify as well. Follow us there. And if you want to learn more about the Service Bureau Accelerator, there's always links in all the descriptions. Click on one of those links, check out one of our webinars, watch some of our YouTube videos. We've got tons of testimonials there as well. Take a look and yeah, jump on a webinar, book a call with us. Happy to answer any other question you guys may have. So again, thanks for listening, everyone, for this episode. And look forward to seeing you on our next Service Bureau Silver Podcast. All right. See ya. Take care.